better. Okay. Hi, I'm Rich. And I'm Casey. We're talking about the turf portion of the Iowa Pesticide Applicator Test. And today we're talking about weed management. So we're talking about starting on page 42 of the book, if you want to follow along with us. So first thing that they talk about in the book is having a good stand of turf grass. It's really important for weed control, isn't it? Yep. Okay. Uh, that means mowing at the proper height, which is the highest you can get, or three and a half inches. Mm -hmm. And proper, proper fertilization and watering is also important, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've got some preparation for weeds, right? Uh, yeah, um, basically what we're going to try to do is explain the different types of weeds and how to identify them, and also the difference between grasses and broadleaves. Okay, now, important thing we should know here. We're looking to help you pass the test. So to pass the test, they don't show pictures on the test. So we're not going to show pictures of weeds. We're going to talk about the way they're described in the book. And how to classify them. And how to classify them so that you can pass the test with that information. So, okay, uh, first off, the difference between a, a leaf and a broadleaf, um, what we got is the leaves are, they, their veins run parallel. In a grass. In right? a grass, yep, okay. grass leaf. And then a broadleaf is uh, kind of like a maple leaf, it's like spread out. Okay. So it kind of goes every, every different so direction. So that would be a classification of a grass or a broadleaf. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the veins are parallel, we have a grass. Yep. Doesn't matter if it's a corn plant or a lawn plant, right? No. And then 2,4-D uh, isn't harmful to the... Okay. 2,4-D is a broadleaf herbicide. Yep. Okay. Then it would be important to know the life cycle of the type of weed we're trying to control, right? Yep. So if we're controlling the annual, we might control it differently than a perennial. Mm -hmm. And if we're controlling weeds in August, it might be different than in May. Yes. Okay. Um, and then there are three major uh, weed life cycles. Okay. Uh, there's the annual, which they start from seed every year. Okay, annual. That means it does what annually? It dies and grows every year. Okay, so it completes its life cycle annually? Yes. Okay, so an annual weed, this is January, and we're in Sioux City, Iowa. An annual weed, so like crabgrass is an annual weed. Mm -hmm. Is there any crabgrass alive in Sioux City, Iowa? Not right now. Not right now because it's all dead, it's all gonna come from seed, we'll have plenty in the summer, mm -hmm. okay? <clears throat> and then a uh, biannual is something that lives two years to complete its life cycle. Okay, so that would, it would grow the first year and yeah. maybe not produce a seed, but then the second year it produces a seed, right? Yep. First year is establishment, second year is the reproductive. Okay, then what's the third one? The third one is a perennial, which a perennial you wanna remember permanent. Okay. So that's something that lives for two or more years. So like a tree or some bushes. Dandelions? Dandelions is a perennial. Uh, bluegrass? Uh, bluegrass is in, yeah, I believe it's perennial. Okay. How about crabgrass? Uh, crabgrass is an annual. Okay. <clears throat> okay, good. So then that's important. That, that information is on the test in some way. Or yes, another, isn't it? you'll need to know that. Okay. Um, and then within those categories, there are uh, different types of grasses that are also classified as weeds too. Um, so like a goose grass, um, that is, uh, it didn't say in there, in there if it was annual or perennial. Well, which do you think? I believe that would be probably the annual. Okay, good. Um, and it's, you can identify it by the, the center is silver with zipper-like seed heads. Zipper-like seed heads, that's on the test. Yep, goose grass. Goose grass, zipper-like seed heads. Test question. Okay, just as a side, would an annual usually grow a little faster than a perennial? Um, uh, yeah, because it needs to complete its life cycle. Yep, doesn't have much time. Got to get serious about this. Yep, mm -hmm. yep, good. Um, and then just to name off uh, different types of perennials, which you'll need to know, um, we got creeping bent grass, buffalo, nimble okay. will. I'm going to interrupt you one second. We're on page 44 of the book. Okay. And and it would be a good idea, we'll go over these, but it would be a good idea to look these over a little bit because the picture isn't as important as the word, the word description. So on the test, it might say, tell us, or like goosegrass, it says, which, which, uh, let me give you the test question, how does it work? Um, it asks you uh, which has a, a silver center of a zipper-like seed heads. Okay. 
Okay. So the description is important, not so much the picture. Yep. And then these these ones, uh, when I did take the test, it does ask you if there are a perennial. Uh, so you do need to know these, like the nimble will, the dandelion, and plantain. Um, also with the creeping tyrant, Charlie, buffalo are all uh, different types of perennials. Okay. Um, even though we do talk about bank grass as being a type of grass, it also is considered a weed if it grows um, where you don't want it to grow. Okay. Um, quack grass is a perennial that spreads underground by underground stems, right? Rhizomes. Okay. And uh, rhizomes you're talking about is different than the creeping charlie. Creeping charlie is basically on top of the surface, and then the rhizomes is underneath. Okay. Yep. Um, and then it talks about curly dock. Um, that's also a perennial. It produces seed by seed, fleshy trap root, and a large stems that have crinkled edges. Classifies it. Okay. And then how did you say that we found it in ditches? It, it's the plant you see in the ditches that it, it uh, well, about late June, early July, it's nice, it's, it's already turned, it's turning brown, and it grows real fast. Yep, super tall. Super tall. Um, and then it talks about ground ivy and creepy char creeping charlie, that's a perennial, and how you can identify them is they're bright green leaves that are round with scalloped edges. Bright green leaves, scalloped edges. Test question. Yep, you'll need to know that. Um, also, white clovers are perennials that have three short stalked leaflets and white flowers. Okay. They're short they stalked look, leaflets, white flowers. It kind of looks like a dandelion, but it's white. Okay. Um, and then it talks about mouse eared or mouse ear chickweed is a perennial. Now, I gotta back up a minute. You said it looks clover looks like a dandelion. The, the top the flower part. Yeah, okay. Okay, I kinda see that. It's white though. It's it's white, but the dandelion is the the leaves don't look like it. Yeah, the leaves don't look like okay. it. I'm talking about the flower. Okay, I gotcha. Uh, uh, the mouse ear chick chickweed is a perennial as well. Um, it can be identified by small, fuzzy, dark green leaves in a dense growth habit. Okay. Um, and then we also have another type of chickweed, which is a common chickweed, and this is a winter annual with small pale green leaves that that have uh, small green leaves that have hairy stems that branch like branch and take roots resembling or enabling the plant to spread over large areas and crowd out turf grass the white star-like flowers bloom during cool seasons okay good so the they're, they're different. Mouse eared chickweed is a perennial, and the common chickweed is an annual. Okay. And then the last one that we're going to talk about is the spotted spurge. And that one's an annual, and it, it occurs in mid season. The small leaves are opposite, frequently have red blotch in the center, and the stem oozes a milky sap when broken. Okay. So break it off and that sap is no milky. Mm. Yep. Did you talk about chicory? You already did, right? Yep, I'm talking about the two different types of chicory. Okay. Chick chick um you're talking chicory. Oh chick no, chicory. Chicory. Chicory um can also be uh identified by its uh bright blue flowers and its rigid rigid stalks and it makes it hard to mow. Okay, good. That's on the test, by the way. Yep. Okay, uh quack grass we talked about. So um, the important thing to remember when doing the test is that uh, the weed selection stops on page 47, but it talks about the description of the weeds. You need to be familiar with that to pass this. It's important. So I'd, I'd encourage you going over that and becoming very familiar with how the book describes the weeds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, and then definitely know the difference between an annual, a perennial, and a, a biannual. One other thing we should cover at this point is that certain, <clears throat> this is on the test, certain grasses are affected by 2,4-D. Yep, like buffalo grass buffalo and grass, bent grass. And bent grass. Buffalo grass and bent grass are affected by 2,4-D. Okay, good. So do we move on to herbicide from here? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, 
real quick way to cover herbicides is that we've got pre-emergence and post-emergence. Pre-emergence, it talks on the, uh, in the study manual on page 48, 47. Pre-emergence are designed to control the, the weed pre-emerge. It hasn't emerged from the soil yet. Post-emergent is the, the, the plant has already developed. So pre-emergent, we would control annuals. Annuals, why not a perennial? Uh, because the perennial is uh, probably already established. Perennial is already established, so if we're trying to control, for instance, dandelions, a pre-emergent is probably not the most effective way, is it? Because it already has a root system. Yeah, it's already there. Yep. So a post-emergent would be the most effective a way. A post-emergent would be the effective way to control that. We're trying to control crabgrass. We decided there's no crabgrass in Sioux City, Iowa today, so controlling crabgrass with post-emergence, while possible, really wouldn't be the, the better way, would it? No, nope, because you would want to prevent it. Prevent it, and we could do that with a nice pre-emergent. <clears throat> the uh, book talks about several different kinds of several different kinds of herbicides. It talks a lot about 2,4-D. 2,4-D is one of the products that, according to the book, is used a lot in lawn care. Uh, <clears throat> there is another part where it talks about the use of non-selective uh, post-emergent controlled perennial grasses. Non-selective, non-selective. It's we'll exactly say. what it says. It's non-selective. It doesn't discriminate. It will kill everything. So what, what product are we talking about? Um, like Quinset. Oh, Roundup. Roundup, okay. okay. Yep. yep. Uh, Roundup will do that. Uh, it just kills whatever. Kills everything, everything it touches. And it may take a little longer, it doesn't kill it immediately, but it, it definitely affects everything that it touches. So why would we want to do that? Um, that way, if your yard is completely out of control or something, maybe we can go through and just completely... So we've got a lot of crabgrass, nut sedge, and tall fescue, and mm -hmm. it's just a lot of different grasses and the some weeds. Maybe just start over. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Then we're going to talk a little bit about drift, and it's important to remember on the test that the, according to the, the test, the most effective way to control drift is to not spray in the wind. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it also talks a little bit about that smaller droplets drift farther than larger droplets. So larger droplets and lower pressure reduce drift also. Mm -hmm. And the closer the spray is to the ground, the less chances of drift. And that kind of makes sense too. If you're this far from the ground or if you're right next to the ground, it's just all things being equal, it's going to drift less. The, the other thing they talk about a little bit is volatilization. And we're on page 50 if you want to follow along. Volatilization, what are we talking about? Um, we're talking about where it becomes. Uh, where, where what becomes uh, what we're spraying on the yard becomes a uh, like a like a like a vapor vapor yes okay so so volatilization the tendency of a chemical to change to a gas yep. uh, these fumes can then move wherever yep. wherever they want at that point and probably not where you want them to be right so it could be bad yeah you don't want to breathe it in you don't want you don't want it to kill somebody's Flowers. Flowers. During volatilization, herbicide fumes are released from the target area, and all herbicides are subject to drift if applied improperly. It's kind of important to know that. Yes, that's what I was just thinking. We need to talk about uh, the risk of injury is directly related to temperature. Dicamba or 2,4-D should, should not be applied if the temperatures are expected to go above 85 degrees on the day of the application. I think the test states something different. They, they talk about, there's a test question that says... It becomes highly volatile. It, yeah, you shouldn't use a highly volatile herbicide above what temperature? I believe on the test it says 75. 75 is the number they're looking for. So the label might say, this is kind of confusing, it's sort of a gotcha question. Yeah. You shouldn't use a highly volatile formulation of a herbicide if the temperature is going to be above 75 degrees. You can use, on the, 
according to the label, up to 85 degrees, but you shouldn't if it's above 75 degrees. So you want to know that on the test. There's a way to really, part, another part of the test really deals with this, but choosing a, a, a lower volatility formulation is what we want to be talking about. An ester formulation or an EC formulation is more volatile than a amine or a you know, water-based formulation. Uh, so why would we want to use an ester-based formulation ever? Um, it, it wouldn't it become it's bigger? Small leaf surface. Small leaf surface. Okay, yeah. Um, so then when it hits the leaf surface, it spreads out and remains the contact instead of running off like the creeping charlie you were talking about has the wax on the leaf so when we spray water on it or our 2,4-D it runs off so in order to kill that we have it in an EC an emulsophile concentrate that way it sticks to the leaf. It spreads out the, the, the oil in there covers the leaf better and you get better control. Mm -hmm. Okay good so there is an advantage to using it. You just have to understand what you're doing. Uh, root uptake. That is right along with what you were just talking about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So that's part of the reason a dandelion is easy to control, isn't it? Dandelions have a fairly large root. Yep, so it's able to absorb our chemicals. And Creeping Charlie doesn't have a large root, so root uptake's slower. Yep. Harder, to, harder, harder to happen. So the oil base would be a lot more suspicion for the creeping charlie. Good. So last line in, in, in this book that we need to talk about that's I, I've seen it on one of the tests. Never apply that camera under the drip line of trees or shrubs growing in turf areas. And I saw that was a test question at one point. I don't know if it's on there anymore. But I, I, didn't, I didn't see it on there. Okay. Um, but that makes sense because it's a root system, so it would go soak up into the roots of the tree and probably do some could damage. damage. It could damage the tree. Yep. So if you take from this the, the, the hints that we had, and the other thing is to remember that uh, the, dis the verbal descriptions that they have of each weed type is important because that's how you're going to be identifying weeds for the test. Okay? Mm -hmm. Good. Anything else we need to add? Um, no, I think the next next section is application, equipment, and calibration, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Good yeah. job.